Thank you. Please be seated. All right, Mr. Bailiff, let's have our jurors brought in, please. All right, thank you, Mr. Bailey. Please be seated. Okay, we're back on the record on case CR 22211624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. The state is continuing to present its case in chief. Apologies for a delay there bringing the jurors in this morning. We were conducting a bit of court business before we got started with counsel. Uh, with that in mind, I'll note on the record, the state is here with the prosecutors present. The defendant also is present with her attorneys. The jurors are all present and accounted for and properly seated, and I believe have all signed their juror affirmation for the day. Is that correct, Mr. Bailiff? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you again for your continuing service and continuing to adhere to that admonishment each day as we break. I believe at this point the state is prepared to call its next witness. Your Honor, the state would call Nicole Heidemann. Very well.
Excellent, thank you. All right, before we get started with testimony then, just a few points of uh, clarification. First, this witness previously testified um, by my notes on April 24th, but we did have you placed under oath again today due to the lapse of time between then and now. And let me just inquire again, uh, as I did the first time in regards to the court's exclusionary order on viewing testimony. Since you were last here to testify, uh, Agent Heidemann, have you viewed or listened to or in any way observed any of the trial testimony that's taken place in the case? I have not. Okay. With that uh, in mind then, Ms. Blake, if you'd like to inquire on direct, you may. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Heidemann, I know you've testified before, but can you please indicate where you are currently employed? The Federal Bureau of Investigation. How long have you been employed with them? Uh, about 15 years. What is your current title or position? A tactical specialist. Did you participate in the investigation regarding the whereabouts of J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan? I did. As part of your role in the investigation, did you review data and other documents recovered from cell phones and or iCloud accounts? Yes. Do you recall specifically looking at iCloud accounts of Lolly Time and Lori for Style? Yes. As part of your investigation or your role in the investigation, do you recall looking for portions of what was later termed the James and Elena story? Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about how that was recovered as far as what type of format you found that story in? It was uh, in a combination of emails, text messages, and notes. With the emails, could you tell who they had been sent from and who they were sent to? They were sent from and to the lollytime at gmail.com account. Do you know who the text messages were sent from and either by and to whom? Uh, they were sent from what the a 515 number that has been attributed to Chad Daybell to uh, Lori's iCloud accounts. And what about the notes? Where did you locate those? Uh, those were in the Lori for Style iCloud account. Uh, there was not any timestamp, um, dates, anything on the, on the notes, so I can't say necessarily where those came from. Through your um, involvement in the investigation, did you determine who James and Elena were referring to in the story? Yes. And who was that? Uh, James was an alias for Chad and Elena an alias for Lori. Did you learn of other aliases for Chad and Lori? Yes. And what were those? Uh, again, for Chad was Raphael and Lily for Lori. And you had gone through... Was it time-consuming to piece this story together? Yes. Did you have to dig through a lot of phone data? Uh, through More through the I, yeah, iCloud data. The iCloud data? Yes. And in piecing it together, was there a reason that you were asked to do this or that you took on the role of piecing this story together? Uh, yes. And what was that? To organize it. It was in so many different places, so to put it together in, into one story. Uh, was my was, was my task. And did you, in fact, uh, compile that at some point into one story? Yes. Did you put that into a PowerPoint uh, presentation? I did. And if I were to show you what was purported to be an exhibit or a PowerPoint created by you, do you think you would recognize it in paper format? I would. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the court defense counsel and the witness be handle, handed States Exhibit 184B. And do you recognize that? I do. And when you compiled that, was that 
the James and Elena story as you found it, but pulled and put together into one readable format? Yeah, it's copy and pasted from the iCloud, but from different portions of the iCloud accounts into one. Yes. And again, the story was located between Lolly Time and Lori for Style? Correct. And then it was compiled to this? Yes. Your Honor, I would move for the admission of States Exhibit 184B. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> I would object as to uh, relevance. I would also like to voir dire an a native objection as to other uh, possible uh, reasons for objection. All right, I'll allow some voir dire native objection, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Um, when you reviewed this Lolly Time account, any uh, Lori for Style account, um, how long were you involved in reviewing that? How long did it take to put it yeah. all together? I, I don't remember, honestly, okay. it was a few years ago. Um, and you've entitled it the James and Elena story. Did the James and Elena story, did that title ever show up in any of this? No. Okay. And you, uh, it seems to be a rather long narrative. Is that right? Uh, yeah, rather long. And so you cut and pasted things from uh, uh, from different places in the Lori for Style and the uh, Lolly Time at iCloud.com? Yes. Is that right? And yes, you pasted sir. it together? Yes. Okay. So there's a possibility that some of this stuff is um, taken out of order the way that you put it together? Uh, the titles in the emails were story one, story two. They were numbered, so I used that as my guide, at least for the emails. The um, text messages I did chronologically as they came through in text messages. The notes were, um, they didn't have any, any time or date stamp, so yes, those were in a little bit differently. Okay. And you understand that Chad Daybell is an author? Yes. That he writes fiction? Uh, I think he does, does he do just fiction or? Uh, I mean, both? he writes some fiction, right? He does write, yes. Okay. All right. And this is a fiction, fictional story? I don't believe that. You no. believe that this is a true story? Yes. Okay. And that's based on uh, your review of the iCloud account? Uh, it's based on um, attributing actual events to, or story events in the story to actual events that happened uh, in their lives. Okay. But a lot of the events in here you can't corroborate, right? I think we're getting past Vordire as to the admission of the exhibit. I think we're getting into questions regarding some additional invest or work done by this particular analyst. Well, I'll, I'll allow a little bit of additional Vordire on this, but you need to get to the point of the objection, Mr. Thomas. Sure. So this, you're, you're saying that none of this is fantasy, it's all, it's all true and this is a, an autobiography or something to that effect? I can't say that, I, I mean, I wasn't there, so I can't say that none of it is fiction, but it is also based in fact. Yes. Okay. So it's a mixture of fiction and fact? Possibly. Okay. Judge, I'm going to object to the, on the basis that um, this witness is going to be testifying to things that are fiction and fact. She doesn't know the difference between the two. Uh, which is which, and she's going to possibly purport all of it to be fact and that there could be misleading to the jury. All right, so there was that objection as well as relevance. Uh, response from the state, Ms. Blake. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, this absolutely is relevant, as was demonstrated by that board dyer. At least portions of this appear to be based in fact. I think what the witness said is she believes that it to, it to be a true story, or at least specific versions of that. The state can inquire further of the witness if the court has concerns about the admission right now. However, it appears that it would be admissible. It is evidence of uh, underlying motive as well and should be allowed. Very well. The court's considered this objection in the context of Rule 403. I'll note also on the record I've further considered objections on the exhibit outside of the presence of the jury yesterday. Um, in terms of the proposed exhibit at this point, 184B, based on the responses of the witness and also considering additional foundation that was uh, laid yesterday by Agent Hart, the court would find that uh, 
the balancing of Rule 403 is overcome, that it would be more um, probative than prejudicial when considering Rule 403. I will, however, uh, indicate that with the response of the witness that nowhere in the text themselves is the title there, the James and Elena story. As I understand it, that's not a title that was uh, found within the text. So the court would consider that part of the exhibit to be demonstrative and would like you to clarify, Ms. Blake, that part of it also, I would instruct the jurors to disregard as evidence the named title that apparently was provided by the witness. But as I understand it, the rest of the information comes from those accounts uh, which were previously admitted into testimony. So I will allow for the admission of Exhibit 184B with an instruction to the jurors also that the title that has been provided for it is demonstrative and the rest of the exhibit uh, may be considered as evidenced by the jurors. Uh, and, Your Honor, just to clarify for the record as well, the second slide says background. If the court would like that redacted or pulled out, uh, the state does not have a problem with that. It's essentially information that was just placed into the record through testimony. Okay. In terms of that slide also, I would just say that would fall within the same category. That's demonstrative. That's not evidence. Um, that was a title provided by the witness in the exhibit. We'll also provide an explicit jury instruction. Uh, on demonstrative exhibits, further explaining that to the jurors before they deliberate so they understand how to consider this evidence. So uh, I appreciate you bringing that to my concern as well. And with that, um, Ms. Blake, the essentially any of those highlighted blue titles, I think, are just they're demonstrative. And that's how we'll instruct that those are not to be considered as evidence, the highlighted blue titles, but the content may be considered by the jurors. So with that, Exhibit 184B then is admitted over the objection. Thank you, Your Honor. You've already talked a little bit about this, but as you went through and you compiled the James and Elena story, did you also compare it to other information? I did. And as part of your role in the investigation, did you review additional things other than phone data or iCloud data? Yes. Did you also discuss the case with other investigators, agents, detectives, officers? I did. In looking through, and I think you've already said this, but you were trying to attribute or determine if there was correlation between things happening in real life and what you were seeing in the James and Elena story. Is that correct? That's correct. As part of that, did you end up finding something regarding when James and Elena met with what uh, was corresponding with Lori and Chad? I did. What did you discover? Uh, in the James and Elena story, it begins in, on October 26th, and there are multiple mentions of October 26th at a conference in St. George, Utah. Uh, there is evidence that shows that Chad Daybell was a speaker at a conference in St. George, Utah on October 26th. Uh, there is a photograph of... Um, Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell, uh, Melanie Gibbs, and Zulema Pastenas in the iCloud account that uh, was texted from Melanie Gibb to a group text short, uh, days after this conference. And uh, Melanie Gibb and other, as, has mentioned that that was the first time that Chad and Lori had met. So the James and Elena story specifically references James and Elena also meeting on October 26th. Yes, and they were introduced by a friend, M.G., in the story. And, Your Honor, I had asked to be handed States Exhibit 53A. It has already been admitted. I can have it showed to defense. It can be published. It can be published? Yes. Well, you, I'm sorry, After confirm with it. the defense and make sure it's what they believe it is that's admitted.
And when you talk about a photo being discovered, is this the photo you're referencing? It is. And this photo was taken from what you had discovered through the investigation to be Chad and Lori's first meeting? Uh, well, I don't know if it's the first meeting, but it, within those days, yes, those initial days. During that October 26th conference? Uh, given the date that this was sent, I suggest that's when that would have happened. Did you discover anything regarding searches completed by the character James and corresponding events with Chad? Uh, yes, in the James and Elena story, James Google searches um, Elena uh, right about the same time that they first meet, and that is consistent with Chad go Googling a Lori on October 26th of uh, 2018. And the only difference being in the story, it was a few days later than October 26th? It was. I think it was a day or two later, yes. But James searches Elena and Chad searches Lori. Correct. Did you notice anything regarding the mention of a novel? Yes. And what was that? Uh, in, the, in the story, James mentions that he had authored a novel titled The Renewed Earth. Um, Chad Dable, as an author, uh, it also it has a novel titled The Renewed Earth. Did you discover anything about events attended later by James and Elena and then that, that corresponded with events attended by Chad and Lori? Yes. And what was that? Uh, the next event would be in November 2018, around the 16th and 17th. Um, they, again, in the story, attend a conference, in, this time in Arizona. Uh, there is also a corresponding um, Preparing People conference in Arizona on, the, on October 16th and 17th, again, where Chad's a speaker. Um, there's, uh, they also have temple records that show that Chad and Lori both visited the temple on the same date or within the same minutes. They um, log into the temple. And in that same story, they talk about in this November trip that they attended the temple together. Um, additionally, there, is, there were statements in the story that said Lori invited um, her friends and other con conference attendees to stay at her residence during that time frame. And her friends have, in uh, statements made in um, interviews that I've read, have made statements that that, that occurred, including Chad Daybell. And in the story, uh, James was offered to stay at Elena's residence during the conference. So both James and Chad traveled to see to a conference in November. Correct. And both James and Chad go to the temple with Lori and Elena. Correct. And that's reflected in temple records? That's correct. And it would have been around the same time that the that James and Elena had gone to the temple in the story? It says mid-November. Uh, I don't believe that one had specific dates like the first one does. It says mid-November, and in the, the Chad and Lori timeline, it's November 16th, 17th, so that would track with what's going on in James and Elena. And then you also indicated Lori had invited friends to stay at her house. Correct. And Elena had invited friends to stay at her house. Correct. And Elena... James stays at the residence. Yes. And Chad stayed at Lori's residence. Correct. As you were going through this and you were finding these things, at that meeting in November in the story, was there also a description of intimate interactions between Chad, or excuse me, between James and Elena? There were. Did you discover anything regard travel that Elena did that corresponded with travel Lori did? Yes. And what was that? In April of 2019, uh, it states that in the story that Elena visits James for the first time in Idaho. 
Um, we have flight records, hotel, um, or we have her, uh, Lori, I'm sorry, we have flight records and bank statements for Lori that indicate she flew to, from Arizona to Idaho uh, in April of 2019 and stayed in a hotel. Did you also review some of the messages contained in the iCloud account outside of the James and Elena? Yes. Did you also review a message uh, from Chad indicating something about a trip to Rexburg? Yes. And so again, Elena travels to James' hometown Correct. or the area of his hometown, and Lori traveled to Idaho Falls. Correct. And for those not from the area, do you know approximately how far Idaho Falls would be from the Rexburg Salem area? Uh, roughly an hour and a half. Could it be even shorter than that? It could be shorter. I'm not. From You're not there. from that area either, right? That's roughly an hour. Could it be even like a 30, 40 minute drive? To, to her leading the witnesses to how far one place is to another. That's sustained. It's leading. So Lori and Elena travel around the same time. Correct. In that story, was there also some description of intimate interaction between James and Elena during that trip? Yes. Did you review anything regarding a podcast in the James and Elena story? Yes. And what was that? Uh, there was a portion of a story uh, that indicated that Chad, or sorry, James travels to Elena or to um, Arizona to participate in a podcast that Lori and her friends were a part of. And did you discover anything regarding, um, and did you indicate you discovered anything regarding Chad's travel? Yes, there is a travel in January of 2019 that Chad, or that Chad travels to Arizona uh, based on flight, again, flight records. And uh, there was a podcast posted online um, in January of 2019 that is, uh, I don't remember the exact title, but something along the lines of Chad Daybell participates in a podcast about his life and experiences um, with Lori and um, other podcast members. And that would have been around the same time as described in the James and Elena story? Or the James? That that portion uh, was in the notes section, if I recall correctly, um, and there, so there was no date and time stamp on that um, as for to attribute to a certain time. And during that, uh, in the James and Elena story, during the time the podcast occurs, were there was there a description of intimate interaction between James and Elena? Yes. And again, as part of your investigation or your review of this data, you also looked at messages contained in the iCloud accounts? Yes. Did you look at messages that were between Chad and Lori? Yes. And Your Honor, if I may have just a moment. You may. And do you believe if you were shown those messages, you would recognize them? Yes. And, Your Honor, the iCloud accounts have already been admitted in their entirety. I intend to uh, pull up a few of those through Cellbrite and would ask permission to publish them. All right. Has the defense been demonstrated what would be published? I don't believe they've been shown the exact images. I did refer them to a report that contains those same messages in an extracted format. I have that in front of me that I can show them or have okay. shown to them. Um, if they'd like to view those before publishing, I'll allow that either to have counsel just walk over there and see what's on there before it's published or if it's in a paper copy that can be delivered.
And, Your Honor, just prior to publishing, I was going – uh, I understand there's an order from the court um, regarding the publishing of the James and Elena. I was going to ask that the witness be handed a copy of her report. I've just shown it to defense counsel. I was going to ask her to read just from the phone extractions uh, a couple lines that would give context to the messages we're going to display. Right. And I can have her indicate on the record what she's reading as far as date, time, who and from received. All right. Any objection from the defense? Just uh, we renew the previous objections. Very well. Uh, the court will overrule those previous objections based on the foundation laid as the witness indicating this would correspond to actual events. So the court will allow this, which was previously admitted, I'll note also, in the form that's uh, been suggested by the prosecutor. And, Your Honor, just to clarify, it's my understanding State's ad Exhibit 184B was admitted? It was. And I just had the witness handed a document. Do you recognize that? I do. Is that a portion of a report that you created? It is. And if you go to the bottom of that, there is a timestamp and there's an indicated indication of a to and from. Could you read the timestamp and indicate who to who the message was sent and who it was from. Uh, the timestamp was August 9th, 2019 at 9.29, 47 p.m. It is a text message from Chad to Lori. And if you would just read the last two sentences of that. He kissed her deeply as their breathing slowed. They entwined their bodies and held each other tightly before soon beginning another powerful round of pleasurable bonding. And then, Your Honor, I'm asking now to display some of the messages that were recovered from those iCloud accounts. They can be published. Can you see that on the screen in front of you? Yes. And can you indicate to who and from that message was sent? Uh, from, since these were recovered from the iCloud, from owner would be uh, Lori's iCloud, to uh, Bubby, which was attributed to Chad Daybell on, uh, again, August 9th, 2019. And was it close in time to that last message? Uh, yes, the last message was 9.29.47 p.m., and this is 9.36.03 p.m. And can you read what the message says? With the emojis? Yes. Okay. That is pretty incredible. Fire emoji, fire emoji, fire emoji, fire emoji. The fire is definitely burning. The memories. Hearts, hearts, hearts. I miss you way too much. You have to stop or I might explode. And then if we go to the next message. Do you recognize this message? Yes. And can you indicate who it was sent from and who it was sent to? Again, from owner would be Lori's iCloud account to uh, the Bubby 515 number attributed to Chad. And can you read that message into the record? The intensity of each encounter in my mind, one greater than the last, oh my, fire emoji, fire emoji, especially this last one. I've never loved you more, heart emoji. It just keeps growing, kiss emoji. And then if we go to the next one, can you indicate who this was sent from, who it was sent to, and then read it into the record? It was sent from the Bubby 515 number attributed to Chad to the iCloud's owner, Lori. Uh, I completely agree. We were definitely in new territory in your bedroom. And then the next one. And can you indicate the date and time, who the sender was, and who it was sent to? Uh, from the 515 Bubby attributed to Chad to the iCloud owner, Lori. And can you read into the record the message? 
Elena's magic hand has gripped the storm, and they stare into each other's eyes, barely able to breathe as intense waves wash over them. And then the next message. Can you indicate who the sender was, who it was sent to, and then read it into the record? From the iCloud owner, Lori, to 515 Bubby, attributed to Chad. Uh, the text content was, yes, she did. Did that appear to be in response to the previous message from Chad? It did. And then I think there's some additional text in between, but if we skip down, I think it was line 1033. Can you indicate who that was sent from, who it was sent to, and the date? From the Bobby 515 attributed to Chad to the iCloud owner attributed to Lori, uh, the text says, I love you, Elena. What a wonderful chemistry we share. Fire emoji, fire emoji. And then if you could read 1032, if you can actually indicate who it was sent from, who to, and then read it into the record. From iCloud owner, Lori, to Bobby 515 number attributed to Chad. I love you more. That's so hot. I just need you now more than ever. I'm sorry. I just need you more than ever. Heart emoji, heart emoji. And then line 1031, can you indicate who it's from, who it's to, and the date? From the 515 Bubby number attributed to Chad to iCloud owner Lori. You are amazing. Please save that segment. I want to read it with you naked, then relive it all. And in your review of those messages, did they appear to reference and correspond with the James and Elena, uh, the characters? They did. Was there indication in there that the <laughs> events in James and Elena were occurring in real life? It appeared to, yes. If I may have just a moment. As you were reviewing the James and Elena story, were there other things that stood out to you? Uh, yeah, there were. What were some of those things? Uh, there appeared to be um, some planning um, of missions and uh, planning to, of their life together as a couple. And did that appear to correspond with events occurring with Chad and Lori? Yes. And, Your Honor, I think we had discussed taking a brief break at about this point. I don't know if we want to have a sidebar. but Okay, let's have a quick sidebar. All right, at this point then, counsel had discussed with the court that there would be a potential objection coming up that would be best argued outside the presence of the jurors, so we'll take that up at this point. Uh, we will allow for the jurors to be excused from the courtroom while we tend to that issue. Once we've uh, concluded the issue, then the jurors can be returned and we can continue with testimony from this witness. All right, please. Thank you. Please be seated.
All right, at this point, uh, I understand the state wants to introduce an exhibit. We previously did discuss this exhibit yesterday in a ruling. The court had issues with this uh, proposed timeline. The state's now submitted for the court's review and altered version of that exhibit. I believe the defense has seen it. At this point, has it been marked with a proposed number, Ms. Blake? And, Your Honor, before we uh, get into the introduction of that, the state was going to ask if we could have just a brief recess um, to allow the state to confer uh, as a team. Okay. We'll go ahead and do that. Let me know when you're ready to argue the issue. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Please be seated. All right. We're back on the record. Uh, Ms. Blake, what's the status of your proposed exhibit? Your Honor, uh, the state is not going to be admitting that at this time. All right. Will you be continuing with uh, direct examination then? No, Your Honor. Okay. <coughs> I think uh, in order for the jurors to track, it would be best if you indicated that once they're returned that you've concluded with your direct examination and we'll confirm that and then we'll allow for cross after that. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. We'll have the jurors brought back in, please. <laughs> Thank you. Please be seated. All right. When we took that break, we uh, were in direct examination. Ms. Blake, uh, your witness, do you have any additional direct examination? So again, as you were compiling and pulling the messages related to James and Elena, did you, in your opinion, did it mirror events occurring in real life with Chad and Lori? Yes. I have no further questions. All right. Thank you, Ms. Blake. Uh, cross-examination? Uh, Your Honor, we have no questions. All right. With no cross-examination, then that will conclude the testimony of this witness. Can the witness be released? Yes, Your Honor, we would ask that she be released. Any objection? No objection. All right, thank you for your appearance this morning. The bailiff will help assist you out of the courtroom. State can call its next witness. Your Honor, the state would call Investigator Edwards. All right. Solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, full truth, and nothing but the truth. The help of God.
Okay, now that the witness has been sworn, let me just inquire before we start with testimony. Um, have you, uh, addressing Mr. Edwards, have you in any way observed any of the trial testimony, either by reading it or listening to it or observing it in any courtroom? No, Your Honor. All right, with that in mind, uh, Ms. Blake, you can inquire on direct. I'll just advise the witness, please talk right into that microphone. Please avoid talking at the same time as anyone asking you a question so we keep a clear record and use verbal responses to any questions. Okay. Ms. Blake, you can inquire on direct. Thank you, Your Honor. Would you please state your name and spell it for the record? Nicholas Edwards, N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S. Edwards is E-D-W-A-R-D-S. Where are you currently employed? I am currently deployed uh, with the military, so I'm actually employed with the United States Army right now. Do you have other employment as well? I do. And what is that? So I'm when I'm not on military orders, I am the lead investigator at the Idaho Office of the Attorney General. How long have you been with the Armed Forces? Since 1999. And how long have you been with the Attorney General's Office? Uh, I was hired with the Attorney General's Office in 2019. At that time, did you become an investigator with them? I did. Do you have prior employment in law enforcement? I do. I was hired by the Pocatello Police Department in 2004. I worked there as a police officer and a detective and a commander over their SWAT team until 2019. I took employment as a law enforcement officer with the Idaho Office of the Attorney General in 2019. Do you have any specialized training in order to be a peace officer? I do. Um, I have a Idaho Peace Officer Standards and Training Certificate. I have a basic, intermediate, and advanced master and supervisory certificate. I hold uh, Idaho Post instructor certificates in, uh, in a variety of topics uh, to include SWAT tactics, sniper observer tactics, law enforcement response to active shooter. Um, I hold instructor certificates for ALERT, which is Advanced Law Enforcement Rapid Response Training. Um, I've been through approximately 3,000 hours of Idaho Post law enforcement training and have hundreds of hours of instructor time teaching law enforcement tactics to include advanced uh, in interview and interrogation courses, advanced investigation courses. So, In your work, have you investigated homicides and or unattended deaths? I have. Do you generally gather information regarding the victim? I do. And why do you gather that information? It's important as, as an investigator to understand the bigger picture, to understand uh, a full understanding of what's happened, so understanding people around uh, a victim, uh, closest to them, past history, all of those things. At some point, did you become involved in an investigation regarding the death of Tammy Daybell? I did. When did you become involved in that investigation? Our office was asked to assist in the investigation of Tammy Daybell's death in April of 2020, 2020. Had you heard of Tamara or Tammy Daybell prior to that? Uh, not really. A little bit on the news uh, about the case overall, but not uh, directly about Tammy. When you became involved, were you aware if there were other active investigations being conducted that were related? I was. What were those investigations? So. When we got asked to help um, with the investigation, we at the Attorney General's office were aware that there was the FBI was involved, Rexburg City, Madison County. There were other law enforcement agencies outside of Idaho as well in Arizona that were investigating the death of Charles Vallow um, and two missing children, J.J. and Tylee. Would it be fair to say that you also assisted or became involved in the investigation regarding the missing children? Yes. Would it be fair to say that this became a joint investigation? Absolutely. And we talked a little bit about you gathering background information on a victim. Did you end up doing that when you became involved in the investigation into Tammy Daybell's death? I did. What did you learn about Tammy? I learned that Tammy was married to Chad Daybell um, and that they had been raised in Utah. They had lived there together. They had five children and that they moved to Fremont, Idaho, Fremont County, Idaho in 2015. Did you learn what Tammy did for employment? 
After they moved to Idaho, she was working at an elementary school in Fremont County um, as a librarian and a technology specialist. Through your investigation, did you learn who Chad Daybell was? I did. And who is Chad Daybell in relation to the investigation? Chad Daybell is the, was the uh, spouse of Tamara Daybell. Did you learn who he later married? I did. And who was that? Lori Vallow. Did you learn anything else about Lori Vallow in regards to the investigation? Um, I did a number of things. One of those was that she had a brother named Alex Cox um, and was previously married to Charles Vallow. And at some point uh, in your investigation, did you learn of Charles, pa of Charles being killed? I did. Do you know when he was killed? In July of 2019. And do you know who was alleged to have shot him? Or who Alex did Cox. Him? Did you learn of a connection between Chad and Alex Cox? I did. What was that connection? Um, Lori was the connection between Alex Cox and Chad Daybell. Prior to Charles being killed, did you learn anything regarding divorce proceedings between he and Lori? Uh, between Charles and Lori? Charles and Lori. Yes, they had initiated a divorce in February of 2019. So prior to just the February prior to Charles being killed, there were some divorce proceedings initiated? Correct. Did you learn anything in your investigation regarding any divorce proceedings between Tammy and Chad? No. Were there any divorce proceedings between Tammy and Chad? No. As part of your investigation, did you review various phone extractions, the data obtained from them, or other documents? I did. Did you also speak with other officers, detectives, or investigators? Yes. Did you, through your investigation, I am missing one slide, just a moment. Through your investigation, did you review some messages between Chad and Lori in early October? I did. Did you also learn of a trip Tammy took to Utah. I did. Do you know when that trip was taken? October 4th and 5th of 2019. Through your investigation, did you learn why Tammy had taken that trip? Um, she had been urged by Chad to take that trip uh, to see her parents in, uh, in Utah. And, Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the witness be shown State's Exhibit 184F. Counselor, can we keep a copy of this? Can we keep a copy of this? Yes, sorry. There is a copy for defense, the court, a courtesy copy for Your Honor as well. Okay. Yes, if you would please look at that. Do you recognize the contents on that page? I do. And did you, in fact, prepare that? I did. Does that appear to contain messages that you had looked at in regards to your investigation? Uh, they are, yes. Your Honor, I would ask for the admission of States 184F. Any objection? No, Your Honor. Okay, Exhibit 184F is admitted. 
And, Your Honor, I would ask for permission to publish that. You may publish it. Can you see those on the screen in front of you? I can. Could you indicate the date, who the message was sent from, and to whom, and read it? Read the messages into the record. The, <clears throat> the top message was October 3rd, 2019 from Chad to Lori. I know the lights on this, but can you see it on the screen in front of you? I can, yeah. And if you could indicate again the date and time, who the message was from, who it was sent to, and then read them into the record. Okay. The top message, October 3rd, 2019, from Chad to Lori, 2131 hours. Quote, good night, Angel Lily, so excited to go on our date. And then there's a fire emoji. And Second, then next one. Okay. October 4th, 2019, text from Chad to Lori at, I think that says 0420 hours. Uh, dreaming of caressing you in your bed, I adore you and sholo you, heart and fire emoji. October 4th through the 5th, 2019, uh, Chad had urged Tammy to visit her family in Springville, Utah. So these messages would have been sent just prior to that trip to Utah? Correct. And those were in early October. Was there another date in October a little later that you focused on? I did. What date was that? There was an attempted shooting of Tammy Davell on October 9th, 2019. And again, that had occurred prior to you becoming involved in the investigation, correct? It had. Why did you end up looking into that date and information surrounding it? Uh, because subsequently she was killed uh, 10 days after that on October 19th. Did you review with other investigators cast data? I did. Did you look at that data yourself as well? I did. Did you look at anything with regard to the whereabouts of a device linked to Homer J. Maximus and subsequently linked to Alex Cox? Yes. And on October 9th, do you recall anything that stood out to you with regard to that device? Yes. And what was that? The movements attached to that device uh, were actually observed going down to the sportsman's warehouse in the middle of the day on October 9th um, in Idaho Falls. And then shortly after that, it, they moved north and drove past the Dayville residence twice. Through your investigation, did you find any link between Tammy Dayville and Alex Cox? No. Any indication that they knew each other? None. Tammy was married to Chad? Correct. Chad knew Alex through Lori? Correct. Was that the only connection? It's the only connection I could find. As part of your investigation, did you also review cell phone data and or iCloud data or other data surrounding contact between specific individuals on October 9th to October 10th of 2019? I did. And, Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the witness be shown State's Exhibit 184C.
I get to look at this? Yes, if you would please okay. look at that. And do you recognize what's on that slide in front of you? I do. And is that, in fact, a document created by you or that you assisted in creating? Yes, I created this. Would that aid in your testimony today? It would. And, Your Honor, I would at move for the admission, and I just handed my copies with the number on it. Uh, it's 184C. I would move for the admission of 184C. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor, we believe this to be cumulative, uh, and uh, this is just a rehash of things that have already been said by other people. Uh, what's the response on that, Ms. Blake? Your Honor, the response on that, and I don't know if the court wants me to go into all of it, um, just briefly, it's a cumulative objection. Uh, the state's position would be that this is not cumulative. I think the standard for that uh, is needlessly. The court reiterated yesterday um, some case law regarding summary, uh, the approval of summary witnesses, in addition to the fact of some of the cross-examination that has taken place. I think this is allowable. I would also indicate that the state's position would be this is not cumulative, and it is not needlessly cumulative specifically. All right, upon review of uh, Exhibit 184C, the court would determine it can be allowed as a demonstrative exhibit, not as evidence. Your Honor, given his last, um, given the last question, may, uh, may I have what your native an objection? Yes, you may. Thank you. Uh, you've indicated that uh, the state asked you if uh, you prepared this or if you helped prepare this. Uh, is that correct? Yes. Did you prepare it? I did. Did you help to prepare it? I, I prepared this in front of me. You prepared that yourself? Yes. No help? No help. Okay. No, no, no objection, Judge. Okay. So 184C is admitted. Uh, again, this is uh, the work of the witness here as a summary, so it's a demonstrative exhibit. It's not evidence. We'll instruct the jurors to that effect, both now and in the jury instructions. And I would ask permission to publish, Your Honor. You can publish. And, Your Honor, this is not wanting to cooperate, so I'm just going to ask that the witness be handed back this exhibit. And, Your Honor, I just verified with defense counsel. I do have a copy of it on my laptop. I don't believe counsel will have an objection to me publishing it from the laptop. Very well. Uh, if there's no objection, then it can be from that source. That's my understanding. It's, it, it, it's exactly the same as what the paper shows. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thomas.
And it may not want to play off of this either. So I'll just ask the witness be handed back that exhibit. Very well. Thank you. On that document, uh, there's a breakdown of some messages at, between some individuals. Can you indicate what it, it was that stood out to you about the contact between who the individuals were and what stood out to you about that contact on October 9th to October 10th. So this breakdown shows uh, I had there were, there were 90 calls and text messages between Alex, Chad, Zulema, and Lori between 9, 12 a.m. on the 9th and 0, 2, 28 in the morning on the morning of the 10th. Then um, I broke that down a little further in this. Uh, there were eight text messages between Alex and Chad between 1.19 p.m. to 1.22 p.m. Alex, Cox, and Chad Davos' phone devices were at or near each other between 1.22 p.m. and 2.20 p.m. There were then 15 text messages between Alex and Chad between 7.13 p.m. and 8.43 p.m. And then the attempted shooting occurred between 9.15 p.m. and 9.25 p.m. And then the last block was four messages between Alex and Chad between between 10.28 p.m. and 10.29 p.m. on the night of the 9th. Did you review messages and calls on dates other than October 9th to October 10th? I did. Did the number of calls that were occurring between these dates stand out to you? It did. And why was that? Uh, there were significantly more during these during this date. And Your Honor, could we have a brief sidebar? Yes. The state's uh, requested an opportunity to take a look at the tech they need for this witness and we'll take a mid-morning recess to allow them time to try to sort that out. So at this point, uh, we'll go ahead and take our morning break. All right, Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> All right, Ms. Blake, were you able to sort out the issue with the technology? I believe we figured it out. I think they brought in a new Elmo. Okay, great. And I maybe would indicate now, and I can put this on the record once the jurors are here, but I did in the on the break, I did ask to be handed a few exhibits that had previously been admitted. I can wait till the jury comes back in if you want, but I just wanted to know that, let the court know that we had asked to be handed a couple exhibits. Okay, uh, let's wait till the jurors are brought in, please. So let's go ahead and have the jurors brought in. This one never got in. I don't think that was the end of it.
All right. Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. We're going back on the record. Case CR 22211624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. We just concluded the morning break. The court would note the jurors are all present and properly seated, as is counsel and the defendant. Ms. Blake, if you'd like to continue with your direct examination, you may. Thank you, Your Honor. And I believe we have the tech issues fixed. If I could publish 184C. Yes, that was admitted. You may. And just for the benefit of the jury, now that we have this in front of us, what are we seeing on this slide? So this was the breakdown slide that I had created with the 90 calls and text messages between Alex, Chad, Zulema, and Lori. And then specifically broke down between who was talking to who with, and also where those electronic devices were located at a certain time. The attempted shooting, the second one from the bottom, that occurred between 915 and 925. And then four additional text messages between Alex and Chad between 1028 p.m. and 1029 p.m. And again, this was a summary of your review of those. So not all 90 calls or texts are reflected on this. Correct. And again, was the 90 calls slash text messages between those individuals a significant amount from your review of the records? Yes. And as part of your investigation into the attempted, or surrounding the attempted shooting as part of the homicide investigation, did you end up actually traveling up to the Daybell property? I did. And Your Honor, I have previously admitted States Exhibit 10A and 10B. I don't know that the defense has been shown those recently. If I could have those shown to defense. Yes. Yes. And Your Honor, where those have already been admitted, I would ask to be allowed to publish those. Any objection? They may be published. Are you able to recognize what residence this photo is depicting? That is the Daybell residence. And Your Honor, for the record, that is States Exhibit 10B. Okay. You personally went up to this residence? I did. And Your Honor, I've just published States Exhibit 10A. Investigator Edwards, can you tell us what we're seeing here? That is an overhead photo of the Daybell property with the front of the residence being to the left where that car is. I don't know if this works. I'll try this. Right there. That would be the front of the residence from the previous photo you just showed, the Daybell property. And through your investigation, did you look into or learn where Tammy generally parked? I did. Where was that? Typically, I learned that she would come to the property and come down the long driveway, which is on this side of the property here, that she would park in what I call the back of the residence and then enter through a back door on that side of the property. On the night of the attempted shooting, did you learn that she did something different? She did. She parked in the front of the residence with the picture you just had shown. And did you learn through your investigation that she would have parked similar to how that vehicle is parked? Yes. Thank you. 
through your investigation, did you, did you become aware of some firearms that were recovered during a search of an apartment associated with Alex Cox? I, I did. Did you ever personally observe those firearms? I did. Your Honor, I've been handed State's Exhibit 281B. It was previously admitted. I had shown that to defense counsel during the break. I don't know if they want to see it again, but I would ask to be allowed to publish it. Any objection to publishing it? No, Your Honor. It can be published. From your review of those firearms, were there any that stood out to you? Yes, the the black firearm that you're seeing there is the 6.5 millimeter Grendel. Are you familiar with those? I am. Do you, are you familiar with firearms in general? Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about your familiarity with firearms and specifically ARs? Uh, I've used one both in the military and in law enforcement for the better part of 20 years. Um, this particular Grendel is a 6.5 millimeter. Um, typically, I'm, we use 223s, a little bit different, but uh, same same platform style. Have you done any kind of trainings or taught other individuals any? with regard to shooting? Yes, I am um, a certified sniper server instructor for POST. I've been through a lot of long distance uh, sniper courses um, and have trained students in, in precision riflemen. And through your investigation, did you learn what type of firearm was reported, <clears throat> excuse me, to have shot, to have been pointed at and or shot at Tammy Daybell? It was reported that there was possibly a paintball gun. Do you have experience with paintball guns? I do. What is your experience with paintball guns? Uh, we use paintball guns in law enforcement and military training as well all the time. Um, very similar to something like this, AR-style platform paintball guns. And in your training and experience, do you believe that a, the paintball gun and an AR can resemble each other? They could. And could you explain a little bit about that? Well, the... the I guess the base of the weapon might look similar, and the hopper that generally sits on top or where you feed the paintballs could be mistaken for a scope. And could they be mistaken by someone that doesn't have experience with firearms? I believe they could. I'm objective. This is speculative. She's now generalizing. This is speculative. I'll move to strike. Or I'm sorry, the answer will be stricken. Thank you. As part of your investigation, did you also review an email that had been sent from Tammy to her son, Mark? I did. And do you recall in that email that she uh, had referenced individuals in the neighborhood having some theories about who may have been the attempted shooter? Yes. Did you follow up on some of those reports? I did. And what did you do? I actually contacted, <clears throat> excuse me, the neighbor directly south, um, spoke with them about paintball guns, kids in the area. Uh, one of the neighbors reported to me that there was uh, kids that wanted to do a paintballing activity. Government object is this is hearsay. Sustained. Did you learn anything with regard to whether or not individuals in the neighborhood or juveniles in the neighborhood tended to own paintball guns? Yes. What did you learn? They did not have any. When you conduct an investigation, do you go where the evidence takes you? Yes. And as you did some follow-up, did that change the course of your investigation? No. Did you do additional follow-up regarding that attempted shooting? Yes. And what was that? I talked to a number of uh, people in the area, neighbors, uh, reviewing the reports, evidence that I had received. As part of your investigation, did you review some searches associated with a Homer J. Maximus account? I did. Were there any of those searches that stood out to you? There were. What were some of those? On October 8th, there was a search uh, for um, Grindle, 6.5 Grindle drop from 100 to 300 yards. And why would that stand out to you? Um, <clears throat> Based on my training and experience, uh, what they're searching for, the searchers looking for drop, which has to do with trajectory of the bullet being fired from a Grendel, 
and what that bullet does from 100 to 300 yards as the bullets, the further you go back, they drop. And is when you talk about the drop, is the ending point of that drop where it would hit the target? Correct. So if you're searching for a drop, you're trying to figure out how far you can shoot and hit the target. Yes, and you're really looking to see what kind of adjustment you need to make on a scope to compensate for the drop is what you're looking for. And in the firearms recovered from the apartment associated with Alexander Cox, were there scopes recovered? There were. And can you describe the different parts of this firearm? Um, you've got the upper and lower receiver. Jack, there's two firearms there. The lower firearm. You may answer. Okay. The uh, the lower firearm, the black uh, firearm, it's got an upper and a lower receiver on that weapon. It's actually connected with two uh, pins, and then it's got a scope on top. And the scope is what would be adjusted for the drop. Correct. As part of your investigation, did you also look into phone calls made surrounding the time of the attempted shooting between others than those, than Zulema, Alex, Lori, and Chad? I did. And, Your Honor, I will ask that the witness be shown States Exhibit 184D. I assume I can keep a copy? Yes. Counsel? Yes. Thank you. Do you recognize what's contained on this page? I do. And did you, in fact, create this? I did. And is it a timeline from October 9th of 2019? It is. Is it uh, containing a timeline for specific times? Yes. And what are those times? So it has uh, times, but text message times are, are in there between individuals, Chad and Lori, Alex and Chad. Uh, there's also a time in there that a casting was being conducted between Lori and Zulema. There's an attempted shooting time on there. There's a time when Emma, who had been Tammy's daughter. Yeah, this has not been admitted into evidence. He's just reading from it. I'm going to check. Sustained. Did you create this uh, in preparation for your testimony today? I did. And is it a summary of some of the events and messages and phone data that you reviewed? Yes. And would it aid in your testimony today? It would. Your Honor, I would move for the admission of this exhibit. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor. I believe it contains hearsay, uh, not within any exception. Uh, he also testified that it contained some of the, some of the he had uh, reviewed himself, and so I'm going to object to that on those grounds. Your Honor, and I would indicate that it is just for demonstrative purposes and to aid in his testimony, not necessarily, I don't, it wouldn't be going for the truth of the matter of anything regarding what defense counsel's alleging is hearsay. It would be for what he does in his investigation. All right, the court's considered the objections lodged as well as the response from the state. Exhibit 1. 84D will be admitted for demonstrative purposes only, not as evidence for the jurors to consider, and they'll be instructed of the limited nature of that particular exhibit and the objections overruled. Thank you, Your Honor. I would allow permission to publish. You can publish it. So did you create this timeline based on your investigation? Yes. And your review? Correct. Could you take us through what we're seeing here? So again, it's a timeline broke down um, between different uh, events that I felt were pertinent in this. So there were text messages between Chad and Lori, Alex and Chad. At approximately 8.30, there was a casting between Lori and Zulema. 
He moved down six text messages between Lori and Zulema. The attempted shooting occurs at 915, um, or approximately. Two text messages between Chad and Lori. There's a phone call from Emma to her mother, Tammy. And then Joseph Murray, who is Emma's uh, husband, calls 911 at 941. Fremont County deputies are dispatched at 941, or correction, 945. And then Tammy herself calls dispatch at 949. Fremont County deputies arrived at 952. And then while Fremont County deputies are on scene, Alex and Lori are texting, Chad and Alex are texting, Chad and Lori are texting. I'm gonna have you slow down Sorry, I will slow down. <laughs> arrived on scene. There were text messages between Alex and Lori, Chad and Alex, and Chad and Lori. And then uh, at 1042, the Fremont County deputy clears. Um, shortly after, there's a phone call of 38 minutes between Alex and Zulema, and then three text messages. Now we're into the night of the 10th, or the morning of the 10th, rather, between Zulema and Alex. I apologize. So after the attempted shooting, you had discovered contact between Alex and Lori? Yes. Chad and Alex? Yes. And Chad and Lori? Yes. And there was a note of a casting being conducted through your investigation. Did you learn who that casting was being conducted on? Yes. And who was that? Tammy Daybell. So the casting was being conducted the night of the attempted shooting? Correct. Did you locate any additional searches on Homer J. Maximus that stood out in your mind? I did. What were some of those? Um, on the 9th, there was also a search for how to clean an AR and additional searches uh, regarding uh, what a Grindle round or bullet might do through a Dodge Dakota or a windshield and the thickness of a door of a particular vehicle. Why did those stand out to you? Uh, because the Daybells owned a Dodge Dakota and uh, so naturally it caught my attention. And were those searches done around the time of the attempted shooting? They were. Did you focus on some additional dates in October? I did. What dates were those? Uh, the 19th, the 18th and the 19th. And why did you focus on those dates? That was the report, 19th was the reported date of Tammy Daybell. As part of your investigation surrounding those dates, did you also look at phone data regarding contact between specific individuals? I did. Did you look at phone contact between Chad and Lori and Alex? I did. Did you also look at some phone contact with Zulema? Yes. Have you also reviewed the phone data attributed to Tammy Daybell and or her email account? Yes. Your Honor, I'm going to ask the witness be shown States Exhibit 184E. And I will indicate there is a copy for counsel, the court, a courtesy copy for Your Honor as well. All right. Do you recognize that page? I do. And was that created by you? It was. Was that created based on a summary of some of the investigation you did in this case? Yes. Did that include review of phone data? It did. Was this created as an aid in your testimony today? It was. Would it in fact aid in your testimony today? Yes. Your Honor, I would move for the admission of State's Exhibit 184E. Any objection?
Judge, we're going to object to relevancy. It appears that Lori was not, Ms. Daybell was not anywhere uh, in the area and doesn't have anything to do with anything on here. All right, response from the state. Thank you, Your Honor. This is a review of phone records, not just data location, and so this includes text and or I think it specifically just has the text messages indicated, but those do include messages to and from Lori Vallow. All right, the court's considered the objection. Uh, I'll overrule the objection as to relevancy grounds for the reasons indicated by the state as a, to relevancy that does contain information that may be attributable to the defendant. The exhibits admitted as an illustrative exhibit, it's not to be considered uh, evidence and will be instructed to the jurors that it is an illustrative exhibit. And Your Honor, I would request permission to publish. You can publish it. And before we go through this, through your investigation, did you learn where Lori Vallow was during October 18th and 19th? I did. And where was that? Hawaii. Okay. Can you take us through what we're seeing on this slide? This is similar to the other one uh, that I broke this down by text messages that were sent between Chad and Lori at the start uh, at 6.13 p.m. to 8.24 p.m. Um, text messages between Lori and Alex, text between Chad and Alex at 8.44. There are 12 text messages between Alex and Lori up until 9.04. Um, text message Lori to Chad, Alex to Chad, Chad and Lori. Uh, 11 text messages between Zulema and Lori. And then Alex, uh, his electronic device shows up at 10.07 at an LDS church approximately 2.6 miles away from the Dayville residence in Fremont County. And just stopping you there briefly, so Alex's device arrives at the LDS church just down from the Dayville residence at 10.07 p.m.? Correct. And previously you'd talked about some text messages being exchanged between Lori and Chad, then Alex and Chad, and Chad and Lori. Those started at 8.52 p.m.? Correct. And they ended at 9.43 p.m.? Is that correct? Or at least that was the last time noted? For Alex to Chad. Or for Chad, between Lori, Chad, and Alex, between the three of them. Correct. And I guess I should be clear, in varying combinations. Right. They continue after that time as well, but up till that point, yes. So Alex's device arrives at the church at 10.07, and then what are we seeing going forward? There are four text messages between Alex and Chad between 10.12 and 10.28, um, at 10.22, there's a, uh, Tammy's phone is active and playing games. At 10.23 to 10.54, there are 10 text messages between Alex and Chad. And at 11.28, there's a JPEG that is deleted from Tammy's phone, the JPEG image. At 11.34, there are uh, two texts between Chad and Lori. 11.46, Alex's phone is leaving the LDS church parking lot that was 2.6 miles away. And then Alex calls Lori from 11.53 to 12.09, right into the day of the 19th, or into the morning of the 19th. Lori sends Zulema a text at 12.10, and Chad sends Lori a text at 12.35. And through your investigation, did you learn when Tammy was reported as deceased? The morning of the 19th. And do you know who reported that? Chad Daybell. Through your investigation, did you learn when Tammy's funeral was held? I did. And when was that? It was two days after, three days after the 21st of October. And you had reviewed some iCloud data and other data associated with some messages between Chad and Lori? I have. Your Honor, I would ask the witness be shown State's Exhibit 29E. I do have a courtesy copy for court counsel and then the copy for the court. Thank you. 
Do you recognize those pages? I do. And are those pages that were created by you as a summary of some of the data you reviewed? It is. I created these. And would they aid in your testimony today? It would. Your Honor, I would move for the admission of States 184. I think it's F. You have this marked as 29E. Oh, excuse me, 29E. Any objection to the admission of 29E? No, Your Honor. Exhibit 29E is admitted. And I would ask to be allowed to publish. You may. Maybe a little blurry on the overhead projector, but can you see that on your screen? I can see it. Could you go ahead and indicate the date those messages were sent and indicate who they are being sent from, who's receiving them, and read them into the record? Okay. Uh, this text uh, chain was October 20th, 2019, between 7.48 and 8.33 in the morning. Uh, I put in here that Lori was currently in Hawaii. Uh, Lori's, the way this reads is everything to the, on the right side of the screen where her name is and then Chad is on the left. Everything in pink would be Lori and everything in blue would be comments from Chad. Um, Lori starts, I am missing you more. I need you desperately. Heart, I can't wait. Two kiss emojis. Need you to hold me tight. That would be great. What about the idea of you coming here Thursday or Friday? Or do you want me to come home? Question mark. Chad replies, their apartment is haunted and we can't clear the place. So they are looking to move anyway, and I have to, and I have the perfect place for them. I need to be here to get some sorting, to get sorting the financial stuff, and I truly need your help. So please come, thir come home Thursday so we can spend the night together. Then, as soon as I have things under control, we can return. I seriously want you, I seriously want you to look for a condo for us while you are there that we can return to at the first of the month. Lori replies, I know exactly where we should be. I don't really care where we are as long as you are holding me forever. Heart emoji. I love, Chad replies, I want to get going full, I believe it's supposed to be steam, stem, on the lily workout plan. Tighten the abs, get a full body tan, and grow my hair out. This could be really good for both of us. Lori replies, I love that plan. Kiss emoji. It's not soon enough, though. This is torture. Maybe you need to clear my mind so I can't remember how much I love you. Heart emoji. I will try, but it feels like Raphael and Lily are together at about 100%. Not sure if this will ever be lower again. Lori replies, that's true. I do feel you. Heart emoji. I feel lovesick. I can't sleep. I don't want to eat. I just want you. It's so consuming. And I think those are sad faces. Um, Chad replies, I know exactly how you feel. I am feeling sad, but it isn't for the reason everyone thinks. And again, these messages are being exchanged the day after Chad reports Tammy deceased? Yes. And could you also indicate the date and time on these messages and who they're being sent from, who to, and then read them into the record? October 20th, 2019, 7.48 to 8.33 a.m. Lori's still in Hawaii. Lori, what's on your agenda today? Chad replies, need to get ready to meet with the mortuary, but I hope to be able to talk in a few hours after I get my parents to go home. I love you so much, my sweet Lily. What time does Audrey arrive? Lori replies, she gets here at 2 my time, so 6 your time. We are going to Sacrament at 9 to listen to see Lisa, hopefully. Kiss emoji, I love you, heart emoji. Chad, I love you most. 
On October 23, 2019, at 8.24, Chad sends Lori a text message. I love you, Lily, eagerly anticipating our alone time, craving you intensely. Three fire emojis. And that last message, the 23rd, is sent the day after Tammy's funeral? Correct. Was Tammy Daybell's body exhumed? It was. Are you aware of the results of the autopsy? I am. What were those results? Uh, homicide by asphyxiation. Through your investigation, did you learn whether or not Tammy had life insurance? I did. And did she? She did. Do you know how many policies? She had two policies. Are you aware through your investigation if those policies paid out? They both did. And do you know who the recipient of those was? Chad Daybell. And do you know when Chad and Lori got married? I do. When was that? November of 2019, November 5th. I believe it's the 5th. We talked earlier about this being a joint investigation. It was. And you were also involved in looking for the missing children? I was. As part of your involvement, were you involved in a search of the Daybell property that occurred on June 9th and 10th of 2020? I was. Was there someone that was in charge of that scene? Yes. Were you assigned specific tasks? I was. And, Your Honor, I would, I've been handed States Exhibit 10 and the subsequent parts. I would ask uh, to be able to publish 10F. I'm not sure if counsel would like to see that first. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that previously admitted? Yes, Your Honor, it was previously admitted. All right, thank you, counsel. Okay. And before I publish that, just a couple other questions. Are you aware of the last time Tylee was seen? Yeah, September 22nd, 2019. Was that Tylee or JJ? Uh, JJ, I apologize. Yeah, and September when, 8th. And, Ty, and JJ was last seen on September 22nd? Correct. And that was of 2019? Yes. When you responded out to the search, were you, you said you were assigned a specific task in the search? I was. What was your role in that? I was assigned to search um, underneath a tree on the north part of the property. And, Your Honor, I would now ask to publish dates Exhibit 10F. Any objection? No, Your Honor. It can be published. Were you given instruction on how to conduct the search? Yeah. What instruction were you given? Um, we were uh, instructed to slowly and methodically uh, look for um, a very designated spot that we believe that uh, somebody might be. Did you notice anything regarding the spot where it was believed a body might be? I did. Um, from the advantage point of standing directly above the tall grass when we first got there, you could see that the contour of the earth was a little bit different. That the grass was uh, something had been disturbed um, in the like a form of a rectangle. And you could see that from directly standing above it. And what actions did you take? in regards to the recovery? So uh, I, I began searching with uh, a few other investigators. Um, we cleared away that taller grass. We then slowly and, and methodically under the direction of the FBI's evidence recovery team uh, peeled that first layer of grass back, uh, exposed some dirt. Um, we went down through the dirt. Exp it exposed some rocks. Uh, we were using small tools, brushes, um, once those rocks were exposed, uh, we removed the rocks. There was more dirt. Um, there were boards, two boards. And we removed the boards. There was dirt. And then exposed uh, to my right, as I was kneeling down on my hands, uh, there was uh, what appeared to be the uh, shape of maybe a, a head uh, in a black bag. And so as part of the search, did you also use your hands? 
Yes. Were you sifting through the dirt and digging with your hands as well? Yes. When you talk about seeing the round um, object or what appeared to be a head, did you observe what was done next? I did. What was that? Uh, FBI's uh, lead cut a small hole in the black bag. Uh, it exposed a white bag. And he cut a small hole in the white bag, and it exposed um, brown, blonde hair. And you were present for that? I was. Uh, and then my experience after that was this flood of emotion that we found him, uh, that we probably found J.J. and thoughts of my own son that was the same age. I have no further questions. All right. Thank you, Ms. Blake. Cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, we'll Just trying to make sure I return the exhibits. Mr. Evers. Morning. How you doing? I'm okay. Good. So it looks like uh, you first started working uh, in 2004 with the Pocatello Police Department. Is that right? That is correct. Did you have any employment before that? I did. Yeah, I worked uh, prior to that. I worked for ISU Public Safety. It's campus security for Idaho State University. Okay. And how long did you do that? Uh, a couple of years, uh, would have been 2002 to 2004, as I was going through school. Uh, you, you went to school at ISU? I did. Did you get a degree? I have an associate's degree in law enforcement, I have a bachelor's degree in criminal justice, and I have a master's degree in strategic leadership. All right, so you got your associate's degree, did you get that at ISU? I did. Okay. And you said you had a bachelor's degree in? Criminal justice. Criminal justice. Yep. Where'd you get that? Uh, American Intercontinental University. I did it online. And when did you get that degree? Now that's a tough question. 2007? Uh, I don't know. I don't remember. It's been a while ago. What, uh, so I have a, a master's degree as well. Okay. So American Intercontinental, that's um, an online uh, college? Yes. Is it accredited with the? It is. It's an accredited university. Okay. Yep. And your master's degree, where did you get that? University of Charleston, in West Virginia. Also accredited. I couldn't tell you the year I graduated on that. It's been a couple of years ago. Okay. Is that also an online university? I compl it's an actual university. It's got a physical campus. I completed it online. Okay. So you testify that you became involved in the Tammy Daybell case in April of 2020. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. Um, and you indicated that Tammy was working at a school as a librarian, is that right? A librarian, yes. Okay. And part of your investigation, did you uh, go to that school and talk to anybody there? I did. Who did you talk to? I'd have to go back. I talked to a number of co-workers of hers. Um, I'd have to look back at my reports. I did a number of reports. I believe there's 26 of my reports out there. Um, but co-workers of hers uh, that had worked with her, her and Emma. Mm-hmm. Emma worked there too, you understood that? That's my understanding, yes. Okay. So there was um, there was an exhibit, 184C, 
where you indicated that there were 90 calls and text messages between Alex, Chad, Zulema, and Lori between 9 12 a.m. on October the 9th and 2 28 a.m. on October the 10th. You recall that exhibit? The one that I that we talked about creating? Yeah. Yeah, I remember. All right. Um, you indicate that there were eight text messages between Alex and Chad between 1 19 p.m. and 1 22 p.m. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about what those texts were about? I actually don't know uh, all of the context of each of those text messages and phone calls. We don't have the content to, for some of them. So you, you just saw that there were text messages. You don't know what they were talking about. Correct. They could have been talking about going to lunch or going to dinner or any number of things, right? Correct. Okay. You indicated that there was some sort of an attempted shooting at 9.15 p.m. that night? Yes. Okay. Um, and then there was a an email that was uh, shown to you or that you you knew about, right? From Tammy to Mark? Is that right. what you're referring to? Yes. And in there she brings up the fact uh, that she thinks that it's some kid in the neighborhood, right? Yes. That shot at her? Somebody shot at her. Right. But she thinks it's a specific kid in the neighborhood, right? I, th I believe so. All right. Um, did you talk to any? You said you talked to a number of neighbors. I talked to, I did. Did you talk to this specific kid that was uh, referenced in this email? I'm not sure who that specific kid was. It wasn't mentioned. Okay. Who did you talk to? Talk to Regan Price, directly south. There were others. Uh, again, there were other people that I interviewed specifically to the paintball question was Regan and Matt Price. And uh, who's Regan Price? Their neighbor. Okay. Approximate age? Oof. That's a dangerous one. Uh, younger than me. Younger than you. Younger well, than you, me. You've been a police officer for a number of years. I have. You're a professional investigator. Yep. I think you could probably gauge someone's age, don't you think? Late 20s, early 30s. Late 20s, early 30s. And Matt as well? Yes. All right. And they said that nobody in the neighborhood had paint guns. Not to their knowledge. Matt was a youth teacher or a youth advisor. Mm -hmm. was going to try to coordinate some sort of activity with the kids because the boys wanted to shoot paintballs, but nobody had a paintball gun was what I was told. Oh, okay. All right. Um, you were shown a photograph of a, a 6.5 Grendel, right? Yes. Okay. Did you actually handle that, that firearm? I did. So you know that it's a fairly heavy firearm. It is a heavy firearm. Yeah. Uh, a lot heavier than your average paintball gun. It is. Yeah. And you said that... There was uh, some sort of a search on Grendel Drop from 100 to 300 yards. Correct. And you thought that that was interesting because uh, Alex owned a Grendel, right? Yes. And there was an allegation that Tammy may have been uh, shot at with a paintball gun. Or with a Grendel. All right. And so you, in the course of your investigation, you testified that you went out to the house, right? I did. All right. Um, you probably asked people, or let me just ask you, did you ask anyone where Tammy was standing and where this person, this masked man was standing? I did. All right. And it was, I'm probably going to, was it more than 100 yards? No. No. It was close. It was very close. It was. And so you've talked about your experience in using assault rifles and uh, the fact that you were on the SWAT team and those kinds of things. Um, and reading the email about Tammy thinking that it was a paintball gun because she heard a click and a whoosh, is that consistent with someone shooting you at close range with a firearm like a 6.5 Grendel? Probably not. Probably not. Okay. 
you were shown Exhibit 184D, which you indicate that you made that was a timeline on October the 9th, 2019, from 5 p.m. to 12.28 p.m. or 12.28 a.m. You remember that? There were two. You have to show me which one exactly we're talking about. Sure. Your Honor, can I publish 184D? Yes. Can I just use my copy or should I use the court's or the original copy? Well, if we can ensure that you've got the same information on yours, I don't mind. We'll just use the court. I don't want to make a record of it, of anything odd. And I will indicate for the record the copies were the same that were provided to defense counsel. Okay. We'll just publish directly from the admitted exhibit. So you're looking at 184D. Does this look familiar to you? It does. Yep. All right. And when you talked earlier about there being text messages between Alex and Chad and Lori and Zulema and Chad and Lori, you don't have those text messages, right? No. So you don't know what they were talking about? Correct. It could be any number of things. It could. All right. You're not speculating that it was about this specific event, right? Well, I could say that it was, based on my training and experience, I believe they were talking about an attempted shooting. Okay. Of a paintball gun? No, of a homicide. Okay. All right. On Exhibit 184E, this is a timeline between October 18th and 19th, 2019, between 6.13 p.m. and 12.35 a.m. You remember that? If you'll show it to me, it would be great. Does that look familiar to you? It does. Okay. Again, these text messages, you don't have any of them. You don't know what they're talking about? Correct. All right. And you look in the middle, it says 10.07 p.m. Alex's phone arrives at LDS Church 2.6 miles away, right? Correct. All right. There has been an earlier testimony that said that this was actually, that there was some sort of a geofence, that it was within 150 meters. Is that correct? I can't remember that. I didn't testify to that. You're not going to testify to that? About the, about what? About the geofence being around, and that's where they found it? That's how they got to arriving at the LDS Church? I got this from the CAST report, correct. If that's what you're talking about, I got this information from the CAST report that I reviewed. Okay. So if the CAST report says that it's within 150 yards of the LDS Church, that wouldn't be at the LDS Church, right? Your Honor, I'm going to object. Counsel's adding testimony not in the record, and I think the witness had already answered regarding the geofence. I'll overrule that. So you're testifying to other people's reports, and you're saying that this is at the church? Correct. Right. But if the other testimony, the CAST report indicates that it was 150 meters around the church, that would be more correct. I'm going to object. This misstates the evidence. I think it's bringing in facts that weren't testified to by the witness, so I'll sustain that. Okay, Judge, can we have a sidebar? Yes. All right, thank you, Counsel. You can continue with your cross. So you were testifying that you had reviewed the CAST report. Is that correct? Yes. All right. And you didn't review any of the geofence information that came from any of the search warrants? I believe I reviewed it. I probably couldn't talk about it right now. I wouldn't know. I couldn't remember it. Okay. Thank you. 
Judge, we have no further questions. Redirect. Yes, Your Honor. Investigator Edwards, as part of your investigation, did you review phone data with other investigators? Yes. And were there other investigators that input the data and created charts or other information for in, and put it into a readable format? Yes. And did you review that data? Yes. And the distance from the church to Chad's house was approximately what distance? 2.6 miles. When you reviewed contact on October 9th and then again on October 18th to October 19th, was there contact between Alex and Lori? Yes. Was there contact between Chad and Alex? Yes. Was there contact between Chad and Lori? Yes. You were asked about if an AR was fired or if a Grendel was fired, if it would make a whooshing sound. Yes. If a firearm jams or misfires, would there be any kind of a sound? No. Uh, it, there might be a bolt or something, maybe the clicking on the trigger, a number of things that could possibly happen. But if it jams before a round comes out, uh, there might be minimal noise. If a round was actually fired off and went by someone's head, would they potentially hear a sound? Yes. What kind of a sound might they hear? A whooshing sound. You were asked about whether or not you followed up on a report of a teenager that may be a suspect in regards to owning a paintball gun. Correct. And you did not follow up with him? No. Again, when you're doing conducting an investigation, do you go where the evidence takes you? I do. Did you locate evidence suggesting or showing a device associated with Alex Cox was in the area of the Daybell residence on October 9th of 2019? Yes. yes. Did you review Google searches from a Homer J. Maximus regarding drops and other information regarding uh, a drop from specific yards? Yes. And that was an account linked to Alex Cox? Correct. Did you also look at a Grendel that was found at an apartment associated with Alex Cox? I did. Did you find contact between Alex and Chad on October 9th of 2019? I did. And again, what's the connection between Chad and Alex? Lori Vallow. I have no further questions. All right. Thank you, Ms. Blake. That will conclude the testimony of this witness then. Will the witness be released from any subpoena? Yes, Your Honor, we would request. Any objection? No objection. All right. Thank you. The bailiff will help assist you out of the courtroom. All right, Ms. Blake, where does the state stand at this point on its case in chief? Your Honor, the state would request a sidebar. Very well. All right, we're back on the record now on KCR 22-211624. Uh, the court had a sidebar with counsel to discuss scheduling for the remainder of uh, today. At this point, the court has determined there are a few additional uh, matters to take up outside of the presence of the jurors, which we'll do shortly. Uh, I am advised that our lunch has been delivered here early, so given the timing, we're going to go ahead and have the lunch recess at this time. Once that's concluded, um, we'll set that for an hour or so at uh, 1240, we'll come back on the record for additional proceedings. All right, please.
folks, you're free to go. Please grab all your belongings to take with you. And we'll be Thank you. Please be seated. Twenty-one one six two four State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. We just concluded the lunch recess. The jurors are not yet present in the courtroom. Prosecutions here, the defendant, as well as the defense attorneys. Before we bring the jurors in, counsel, I wanted to inquire. There was a question on making sure all of the exhibits that were admitted through the witnesses that have testified thus far were in the court's record. Uh, counsel, is there anything you want to put on the record from the state as it relates to exhibits at this time? Your Honor, it's my understanding that we did have an opportunity to review the exhibit list and confirm with the clerks the admission of the exhibits that had been presented by the state. <laughs> okay, so you don't see any amendments we need to make to what's already been lodged we do not your honor thank you okay um one issue i'll clarify i'm not sure we've received yet we had on those guns and the baffle of the gun and the two baffles we had an agreement that in lieu of submitting the physical items into evidence I think we have the image that the court is requesting just being brought in now. Okay. I am not sure that we do have one of the baffles, so we can get that. We've not shown this to defense counsel if we can show them. It is an image of the firearm that was brought in, uh, just a photograph taken of it. So this is what's going to go into the record, or is this what's going to go back to the jury room? or both? <laughs> The this is only for purposes of uh, post trial record, okay. not what goes in as evidence. The exhibit itself will be allowed to be viewed by the jurors in deliberations. This is for the appellate record. Okay, I'm okay with that. And Your Honor, we had failed to pull the photograph of the baffles we'd forgotten, so we are requesting that one be provided, and we can show that to counsel in the court as well. We're just messaging someone to to get a photo of those. Okay, and counsel, uh, given the time, I, I don't see it as a problem to get those in and submitted. They are really, it's a, it's a different type of submission of evidence um, that where they're replacing the physical evidence for the record of the case to be lodged in the case. So uh, I don't believe those are required to be already in the record before the state rests is what I'm saying. I think those can be put in at any point. Uh, before the case is totally concluded. Do you, would you like those marked with an exhibit sticker reflecting the exhibit number and then maybe just a note indicating that there's, it was really a physical exhibit? I think that's how the rule would read for you to do that is to have them relate to what, uh, they're the representation of a physical exhibit that was too large or dangerous to include, uh, to be held for the appellate record. So. We will uh, get the photo of the baffle, show that to defense first to make sure that that doesn't cause them any concern, and then we can get them marked and submitted to the court. Okay, and we can get those uh, in, like I say, w unlike other evidence that must be submitted in your case in chief, that's uh, sort of a replacement under the rule for the record of the case, not the exhibit. So at some point, I don't think it's necessarily required to be done right at this time. So if you'll just follow up on that, we'll make sure that it comports with the order that we already entered on the record as it relates to those three exhibits. All right. Um, at this point, then, I believe we're probably ready to have the jurors return so we can continue with proceedings. Is that correct?
Anything else the state wishes to bring up before the jurors are brought in? And, Your Honor, I think the only other issue is there is a clerical error in the indictment. We were trying to get the amended indictment corrected for the court, but due to the format that we had it saved in, we'd run into some technical issues. I'm not sure if we could make a, a record of that and then get that clerical error corrected and submitted to the court. Is that going to be brought as a motion, then, to alter or amend the indictment? Yes, Your Honor. Oh, an amended information or, yeah, the amended indictment. Uh, is the defense aware of that? No, we, this is the first time I've heard of that. Okay, I wasn't aware of that either, so, uh, that would be, I think, properly a motion to be argued outside the presence of the jurors. Would you agree with that? Yes, Your Honor. Well, given the status of where we are, I think we need to get that issue taken care of and resolved uh, before the jurors probably return would be the time to do it, although I do want to have the defense an adequate opportunity to see what the proposed amendment would be. So if you have that information, uh, why don't you discuss it with the defense, and then I'll come back on the record, and we can have a motion if there is one as it relates to any altering or amending amendment of the state's indictment that sounds good your honor thank okay. you we'll be in recess all right <laughs>
we had inadvertently marked 4A, which is theft by possession. However, the language of the indictment is clear that it's theft by deception. So we are asking to amend that 4A in those counts to the 2A to match the language of the actual charging document. And the other clerical error is in count 5 on the overt act. Ten, where it did read Alex going to the gun range in the months before October 9, 2019. That was intended to be month, which is in compliance with what was presented in evidence. And so the state is moving to make those clerical changes. Nothing in this adds a new charge. It's still grand theft, and this brings the indictment further into compliance with the actual language used. And we do not believe that the substantial rights of the defendant would be affected in any way, shape, or form by this. She's been on notice the entire time by the language of the indictment. All right. Who would be arguing for the defense? I will, Your Honor. All right. Mr. Archibald, if you'd like to present any argument in opposition, if there is any. Your Honor, I have asked for a copy of an amended indictment. I haven't received that yet, but I can still make some argument while we're waiting for that. The indictment that was filed here, we're looking at the indictment that was signed by the grand jury foreman on May 25th of 2021. So two years ago, this indictment was filed with the court. It has not been amended for two years. We have requested the amendment as her defense team. We have asked to amend this, and that's been denied. And now the state is asking to amend it two years later. And Idaho Code Section 19-1420 indicates an amendment of an indictment cannot be amended so as to charge an offense other than that for which the defendant has been held to answer. And so by changing the code sections of the statutes, they are changing the codes. Their proposal is to change the code sections from grand theft by intent to deprive another to grand theft by deception. So grand theft by deception is a different code section than grand theft by intent to deprive another of property. So these are different charges. They are not just mere clerical errors. And so what's happened here is the grand jury, if the grand jury indicted her on the wrong code section, then we've been operating under that for two years. And so she hasn't entered a plea yet to the new code section as proposed by the state. So it does affect her substantial rights. So I have asked for a printout from the state of their new proposed indictment so that I can confirm their proposed language today as opposed to what the grand jury indicted her on some two years ago. And so that's my concern, Your Honor, is that it sounds like their proposal is not a mere clerical error, but it does affect the substantial rights of my client. And if that's the case, then this error is fatal. All right. Response from the state. Mr. Wood. 
Your Honor, we believe that the language of the indictment was clear and adequately put the defendant on notice of what she was charged with, that she was charged with grand theft by deception. I would note that either way the state has, we believe we've met the burden of either of those. However, the plain language of the indictment is clear, that she was charged with theft by the conspiracy to commit murder and grand theft by deception. It's in that, not only is it in the heading, it's in the language. All right. And to be clear again, Mr. Wood, which of those counts were you seeking to have amended in the information? One, three, and seven. All right. Going back to just Mr. Archibald, as to the, well, I actually don't have any further questions as it would relate to count five and the request to change the overt acts language. So the court's considered both Idaho Code 1914.20, which governs the amendment of an indictment, which is what we have in this case, an indictment returned by the grand jury. I've also reviewed criminal rule 7E, which also relates to amendment of an indictment. 7E states the court may permit amendment of a complaint and information or indictment at any time before the prosecution rests, if no additional or different offense is charged, and if substantial rights of the defendant are not prejudiced. 1914.20 says an indictment or information may be amended by the prosecuting attorney without leave of the court at any time before the defendant pleads or at any time thereafter in the discretion of the court where it can be done without prejudice to the substantial rights of the defendant. And information or indictment cannot be amended so as to change or to charge an offense other than that for which the defendant has been held to answer. There's a case, State v. Jeske, 164 Idaho 862, 2019 case that says the decision to permit an amendment is a matter within the discretion of the trial court. That cites to a case, State v. Severson, 147 Idaho 694. The court may allow an amendment of an information at any time before the prosecution rests so long as doing so does not prejudice the defendant's substantial rights or charge the defendant with a different offense, citing to Criminal Rule 7 and Section 1914.20. And a case, State v. O'Neill, 118 Idaho 244. So there's discretion here for the court to consider that under the rule. At the outset, I will note clearly the concerns raised by the defense that it just, the timing's sort of unbelievable with the number of prosecutors that have worked this case for so long that it's not something that came up in the course of trial or testimony. It's just making a correction here on whatever day of the trial we're at. We've been in trial for a very long time and we're getting towards the end of the trial. And this is the kind of motion that clearly the court doesn't like having all of our jurors sitting around waiting for us to take these matters up that could have been done by motion at any point before now. So disappointing that the court has to consider this right now at this stage of the proceedings, but the rule does make clear that it can be done up until the time the state rests. The state has not yet rested. So there are four proposals sought to amend and change the indictment. The count five over at Act 10, where it would be amended from months, plural, to months singular, the court finds that is more in the nature of a clerical correction and would not in any way affect or prejudice the substantial rights of the defendant by 
changing that so the court will permit that overt act 10 in count 5 to be amended to the singular term month, not the plural term months. As it relates to counts 1, 3, and 7, count 1 is charged in the indictment as conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grand theft by deception, a felony. Uh, it then does list the code sites underneath 1824034A is what's specifically stated there. Uh, looking at that, I guess a few things. The There's multiple purposes of an indictment, but mainly to put the defendant on notice of what they're charged with and also to advise and instruct the jury what the defendant's charged with. The code sites probably have no and should not have any significance to the jurors uh, as they'll be instructed on what the law is as it relates to the Idaho Code section, which in this case is 182403. So the difference is there's a 4A sub, the state wants to amend to a 2A, and so the court has to consider whether that amendment would be a substantial rights of the defendant coming into play as being prejudiced at this stage of the proceedings if the court were to allow that. There's another statute I think that can come into the analysis which is Idaho Code 191417, which talks about words of the statute, words used in a statute to define a public offense need not be strictly pursued in the indictment, but other words conveying the same meaning may be used. When the court has considered the proposed amendments, um, count two under 192403, two, a is a theft uh, under A. It says by deception obtains or exerts control over property of the owner. 4A is not by deception. It's where it, uh, someone takes property and, quote, intends to deprive the owner permanently of the use or benefit of the property. Because the language of the indictment, not the code site, does include the term deception in count one, both in the caption of what count one is, what's already been read to the jurors in this case, and also in the charging language at the end of the first paragraph. It says to commit grand theft by deception. The court finds on that count that the proposed amendment would not at this point prejudice the substantial rights of the defendant since the defense has been placed on notice that the theory under which the theft is alleged by the state is a theft by deception. So the court would find that the indictment may be amended under Rule 7E as well as 1914-20 as to count one because it ex contains that express explicit language of theft by deception. For that same reason, a mirroring language in count three, which also is charged as, quote, conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grand theft by deception. And in the charging body of the language, uh, it also states to commit grand theft by deception. The court would find that did provide adequate notice to the defense throughout the proceedings of the theory under which the theft was being pursued, although it didn't conform necessarily with the subsection of 2403. So the court will permit the amendment on that count. And then finally, as it relates to count seven, which is a count of grand theft felony, uh, that is just charged generally as grand theft. And the court considered that it's charged under 4A. Uh, it does contain in the body of it as well the word deceit saying that uh, between Madison and Fremont counties by deceit and with the intent to deprive another of property and the court would note that that deceit language or deception is not contained anywhere in the 24034 subsection but is only contained in the subsection 2 
So the court would find again under 1914-20 that the indictment and under criminal rule 70 is not going to prejudice the substantial rights of the defendant. In this case, the motion's been made before the state rested. And for those reasons, then I'll permit the amendment as it relates to paragraph seven of the indictment also. So the state's instructed to submit a conforming new amended indictment for filing in the case, which must be received by the court, obviously, before the jurors go in for deliberations and before the final instructions are completed in the case. That'll be the ruling on the motion then. Any questions on my ruling, Mr. Wood? No, thank you. All right, any questions from the defense? No. All right, thanks, counsel. With that being said, then let's go ahead and bring our jurors back in. All right, please. All right, thank you. Please be seated. Okay, we are on the record on case CR 22-21-1624, State of Idaho v. Lori Noreen Vallow. The state has called or had a, just completed a witness who testified and the state continues with its case in chief. Does the state have another witness to call at this time? We do not, Your Honor. So does the state rest? The state rests. All right, thank you, Ms. Blake. All right, let me next inquire of the defense at this time then. Is the defense going to be making any motions that would need to be made outside the presence of the jury? Yes, Your Honor. It is customary for the defense to make a motion after the state rests. We'd like to do so. Okay, well, considering our timing in that motion, the court would note that there is a motion that will be heard outside of the presence of the jurors. And I'll note the holdover at lunch was another motion we were also hearing here. Given the time that that motion may take and for the court to prepare a ruling, would the defense prefer that we allow the jurors to be excused for the day? And I'll ask the state as well so that we can be prepared to proceed again in the morning. May we have a sidebar on that issue? Yes. All 
All right. The court just uh, com had a sidebar with counsel, and we were talking about the best use of our time for the efficiency of the proceedings here. Uh, I'll note that at this stage of the proceedings, it's not unusual that we do have to have some time for administrative matters uh, and hearing of motions in the case. So we're going to take another recess at this point to allow for some additional preparation. Uh, we'll have the jurors just wait until uh, they can be brought back in, and I think that'll be a more efficient use of the jurors' time, and then we'll sort out an efficient schedule moving forward after today also, depending on uh, where things land today, this afternoon. So in lieu of excusing you earlier, which I had considered, uh, we'll have you continue to wait uh, and argue a motion outside of your presence and allow for the defense to do that. We'll then have you brought in and give you further instructions on how we'll be proceeding going forward. So uh, these are the times there was an instruction early on that said, at times, uh, there are delays that occur when we're working on other things. That's what's happening now. So I'd ask you to not be discouraged by that, and we will diligently work to move things forward. And uh, we'll take another recess at this point and take up these legal issues outside of your presence. All right, Thank you. Please be seated. All right. At this time, uh, the state has rested. Mr. Archibald, is the defense making a motion at this point? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, under Rule 29 of the Idaho Criminal Rules, uh, Rule 29 provides uh, for a mechanism for the court to review the evidence that's been submitted and, and determine if there's been sufficient evidence on each count to proceed to the jury. So under Rule 29, we're asking the court to uh, review the evidence um, and determine if there's sufficient evidence on each count, including the overt acts, as this is a complicated case, uh, to submit the matter to the jury. I believe Rule 29 does uh, give the court uh, discretion to uh, take that matter under advisement, under Rule 29B. And so if the court needs some time to review the evidence and compare it to each count, um, we're, we're okay with that. Uh, we're not opposed to the court taking the time necessary to review that. And so um, while the court reviews that, I would be asking for a break so that uh, me and co-counsel and my investigator can meet with my client to determine how and if she wants to proceed with presenting a defense. I would ask, say it's about a quarter to two, I would ask for at least a 15 minute recess uh, so that, and the marshal, I'd ask, can take us to a secure location so that we can have an open uh, discussion about my client's right to, to proceed. All right. Um, one point I think needs to be clarified here as it relates to Rule 29. The... 29B allows a decision on the issue to be reserved if it's that uh, motion made at the close of all evidence. 
under 29A, um, and we're at that stage of the proceedings. It's before submission of the jury, after the prosecution closes its evidence. Um, then, according to the rule, if the court denies the motion at the close of the prosecution's evidence, the defendant may offer evidence. So what you're suggesting, Mr. Archibald, is I would say Rule 29A gives you the option to have me make a determination before you go forward with evidence. Um, under your proposal, I believe you'd be waiving that if you are permitting the court to take the judgment of acquittal under advisement before determining whether or not you're going to rest your case. So um, why don't you look at that, think about that for a moment, and with that in mind, I'll ask the state if you have a responsive argument under the Rule 29 motion that's been made. Yes, Your Honor. All right. Um, and we would, I would cite to you a couple cases for this, the court. State v. Huggins, 103 Idaho 442. It's an Idaho Court of Appeals case from 1982. It outlines the test for deciding a motion for judgment of acquittal under Idaho Criminal Rule 29 is as follows. The trial judge must review the evidence in the light most favorable to the state, recognizing that full consideration must be given to the right of the jury to determine the credibility of witnesses, the weight to be afforded evidence, as well as the right to draw all justifiable inferences from the evidence. Viewed in this manner, where the inculpatory evidence presented as to any essential element of the crime is so insubstantial that jurors could not help but have a reasonable doubt as to the proof of that element, a judgment of acquittal should be entered. The state's position in this case is it is a rare circumstance that judgments of acquittal tend to be appropriate. As the court already noted um, in citing to Idaho Criminal Rule 29, there are different times that uh, defense may make a motion for a judgment of acquittal. We are under 29A before submission to the jury. It would be the state's position that we have presented evidence to support every element of all nine counts of the indictment, that we have presented evidence that would not lead to the jury having no choice but to have reasonable doubt. And we believe that this would be appropriate to be submitted to the jury for their consideration at the close of the defense's presentation of any evidence. So we would ask that the court deny the motion. All right, uh, response, Mr. Archibald? You know, I, I understand the standard and I understand the language of the rule. Whether the court makes a decision under 29A or 29B, I'll leave that up to the court. Uh, if we do not present any evidence, then uh, then that issue uh, would be moot in any event. All right, with that in mind then, the court would note, I've raised that issue under Rule 29 where we're at A at this point. Um, it's the type of motion that does require the court to look at each one of the elements of each of the counts and the indictments fairly lengthy in the number of counts and so the court needs to go back through and review the evidence that's been presented to ensure that uh, Rule 29 judgment of acquittal as to any of the given counts would not be appropriate given the standard I have to consider. So the court will need to take that issue under advisement and what I'll do given the comments there by Mr. Archibald is I am reserving ruling on that motion and if the defense wishes to move forward with their presentation of any evidence, then I'll, without prejudice for you to re-raise the motion, uh, the court will make a ruling on the record but will not be able to do so this afternoon. So it is under advisement and Mr. Archibald will provide you time to have a private consultation with your client and Mr. Thomas. The court's instructed that in order to allow for that, uh, this is the most secure setting here in the courtroom, we're going to require that 
everyone be cleared from the courtroom except for only the required uh, security personnel that need to remain in the courtroom and all other parties including the court and any court staff will need to uh, exit the courtroom in order to allow for a privileged attorney-client conversation to be able to take place between counsel and your uh, client at this time. So we'll be in recess until further notice. Uh, Mr. Archibald, Mr. Thomas, once you've concluded consultation with your client, please advise the court. Thank you. All rise. Thank you. Please be seated. All right. We are back on the record on case CR 22211624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. The state has rested its case in chief. We took a recess, uh, a Rule 29 motion for judgment of acquittal was argued and taken under advisement by the court. Counsel for the defense wished to have time for a privileged and private communication with their client regarding proceeding forward at this time. So let me inquire of the defense now. Um, Mr. Archibald, have you and Mr. Thomas had an opportunity to consult with your client? Yes, Your Honor. And how does the defense intend to proceed going forward? Your Honor, uh, we don't believe the state has proved its case, so the defense will rest. Very well. Does the uh, defense then is, I'll just inquire of your client, Mr. Archibald. So, Ms. Vallow, mm -hmm. you do have the Fifth Amendment right to, uh, in this case, uh, according to the Fifth Amendment, it's guaranteed by the United States Constitution that no person shall be compelled in any, any criminal case to be a witness against themselves and this privilege applies to Idaho through the 14th Amendment. Um, that guarantees that no person may be compelled in a criminal case to testify. So you do have that right and will maintain that right and uh, is it your decision to continue to maintain that right and uh, not testify in this matter? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, thank you for your response, and I appreciate counsel discussing that with your client. With that in mind, then, counsel, uh, I believe we'll have the jurors brought back in. Mr. Archibald, if you intend to rest, let me just clarify with this Rule 29 motion. If you are going to rest, I think I would be reserving a decision on that under Rule 29B. Is that your understanding? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, the court will consider the motion under Rule 29B then, and it will remain under advisement and the court will issue a ruling on that in due course. So with that in mind, we'll have the jurors brought in. Uh, counsel, the court's uh, schedule at this point would then have the jurors excused for the day. Tomorrow the court will spend the day working with counsel throughout the day to get the jury instructions determined and completed and all copied and ready and then we would be commencing with the closing arguments on Thursday morning. Is that the schedule that would be satisfactory to the state? Yes. Will that schedule work as well with the defense? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, I am going to advise the jurors then of that schedule so that they're made aware at this time then. Let's have the jurors brought in, please.
All right, please. Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. All right. At this time, we are on the record on case CR 22-21-1624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. We took a break for uh, further uh, matters outside the presence of the jurors. The jurors are now here returned. At this time, the state has rested its case in chief. This would be the time then for the defense to present its case. Uh, Mr. Archibald, upon consultation with your client, would you please advise the court on how the defense is proceeding at this time? Your Honor, after consultation with my client, we don't believe the state has proven its case, so the defense rests. Very well. The defense has rested as well at this time then. So I'll just advise the uh, jurors that will conclude the evidence portion of this trial. Uh, what will happen next is the court will need to uh, go through the jury instructions you'll be receiving before uh, your deliberations begin. There will be a jury instruction conference with counsel tomorrow uh, given the amount of evidence and the number of charges here that will take some time so we're going to have you be excused for tomorrow we will continue then Thursday morning with the closing arguments which will be uh, presented to you by both sides which will be a summation of the evidence and that will take place before your deliberations begin and then you'll be given your final jury instructions so that will conclude the trial proceedings for today. Uh, at this point, then, uh, you'll be excused until Thursday morning with tomorrow off. And so let me just please advise you with that extra day off. Uh, again, please follow the court's admonition to not discuss the case amongst yourselves or with anyone else. Don't do anything to look the case up, to investigate the case. If you see any reporting on the case, Please uh, turn away from that and don't do anything which would affect your ability to maintain your impartiality in this case. Uh, the court and the parties appreciate your continued adherence to that admonishment each day as we break. So with that, we will uh, come back on for additional argument, uh, closing arguments on Thursday morning, and we'll plan on starting again at our normal time at 8.30. So that will conclude the proceedings for today. All right, Thank you. Please be seated. All right, counsel, I would just ask that the parties uh, make themselves available tomorrow. I'll have my staff attorney reach out to you for some scheduling of when we'll be going on the record as it relates to the jury instructions. We'll be meeting uh, with counsel first informally to go through the proposed jury instructions uh, once uh, we've gone through any agreed upon instructions. Any that are contested will be placed on the record and the court will make rulings on those in an open proceeding and we'll let counsel know about what time we think we'll be prepared to uh, meet with you first informally for the jury instruction conference tomorrow. So that will conclude the matter for today. Anything further from the state this afternoon? No, thank you, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Anything further from the defense? No, thank you. Okay, thanks, counsel. That will conclude the day, and we will see you tomorrow.